to New Testament Christian Church here in Jacksonville. I've not had an opportunity to introduce myself to you yet. I'm Pastor Carter. We welcome you. We just consider you a visitor once after that. You're just part of the family. So we appreciate what God is doing in lives. And right after this, for those of you that maybe you do not know, right after this, worship service. We have a baptismal service planned for a bunch of these brothers and sisters here, and we're excited and we give God the glory for what He's doing. Amen. By chance, if you decide today to make Jesus your Lord, Say, how do I do that? By a conscious decision. You will not slide your way into heaven. You have to make a deliberate decision that Jesus Christ is your Lord. It's not by virtue of your mom and dad being a Christian. It's not by virtue of you going to church. You must let Jesus come into your life. He's Christian cliches. In other words, you must surrender your life to His Lordship. And you must, not just believing, because anyone can believe. He said, even the, the Bible said, even the devils believe on Jesus. And they tremble, so that's not believing, but it's a belief and your it's faith in Jesus, what He's accomplished. And then you're renouncing of the sin that crucified Him. Amen. So if you say, that's what I'm going to do today, preacher, I want you to know that right after that, you need to be baptized in water. You say, well, I don't have any clothes to change into. We have clothes here for you. Because okay? we've already figured. We've already, we, by faith, we believe that someone's going to get saved today. And they're going to make Jesus their Lord today. You say, well, I've made Him my Lord. I'm going to, I just rededicated my life to Him. Should I get baptized again? It's on, up to you. If you were serious before, and you are undoubtedly serious now, it's up to you. Okay? Well, I was baptized when I was three. My mom and dad did that. Or I got baptized when I was 14. I got away from God. Should I do it again? I think you should do it again. Okay? It's all up to, again, this is between... God and we're fulfilling the commands of God. Well, I'm I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to get I'm not going to get baptized in water. Well, that is a deliberate disobedience to Jesus. Man, I know you don't like hearing it, but look, my honor is to Him first. Okay, I love you and I want you to go to heaven, but I'm not here to placate you. I'm not here to. I want to be your friend, okay, but I've got to get you to heaven more than anything. And so sometimes there's going to be some hard truths that I may share with you. And it's all in love. Okay? As you know, someone who knows the truth and won't tell you is your biggest enemy you've ever met. Someone who knows the truth and will not tell you is the biggest enemy you've ever had in your life. So let's get into it today. Why don't we pray before we go? Reverend Scott, lead us in prayer, please, sir. Amen. Amen. Let me read to you from the Word of God, if you have your Bibles. Genesis chapter 41, 
Verses 50, 5 0 to 52. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Azanath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. He says, he said, this is why he's going to call him Manasseh. This is what, this is what Manasseh means. For God has made me to forget all my toil and all of my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Verse 51 is where I need to draw your mind to today. He said he called his firstborn Manasseh. He said, God has made me to forget all of my toil and all of my father's house. We're preaching to you about on a, on a series entitled The Leap of Faith. Last week we talked about a leap of faith, taking a leap of faith for your future. What God has in store for you. Today we're going to take a leap of faith when it has to concern, it's concerning our family and our friends. When we say a leap of faith, what we mean is, we've all heard that term, but maybe exactly the meaning, where we mean we're going to take a jump, we're jumping into the unknown. We're going to go where possibly we've never gone before. There's uncertainties there, and none of us like uncertainties. We like things to be a certain way. We love surprises when they're controlled surprises. We love, oh, it's my birthday. Oh, you guys shouldn't have had. You know, we love that. Not me, preacher. I don't like anything like that. Well, go stick, put your head in the mud then. Forget it, all right? Just the way it is. We like surprises. We love and when, when things are when things are going our way. We, we really enjoy those. We're looking at a man by the name of Joseph. Now, when I say Joseph, we're not talking about the adopted father of Jesus. This Joseph that we're talking about lived a thousand, maybe about uh, 2,000, approximately 2,000 years before Jesus came on the scene. So about 4,000 years ago, this man by the name of Joseph lived. If you've never read about him, his story is in Genesis chapter 37, all the way to chapter 50. And it's just a, an epic man and, and just really talk about a hero of faith. I'm just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal man of God. As we begin to unpack his story, Joseph is going to show us these lows that, deep, that dig and they go down so very deep. His life is one that is riddled with adversity and heartache, betrayal, allegations and accusations, false imprisonment. He's going to be humiliated beyond compare other than our, than our Lord Jesus Christ. But yet Joseph also teaches us how to be graceful when he triumphs. See, some, they can take a good licking. They can take a good punch in the face. But you give them, uh, you give them prosperity. You give them success. And it goes to their head until they're absolutely just horrible to be around. Just proud for no reason. Joseph shows us how to win and how to lose. If you're a sore loser, sorry, my friend, I, I'm, I'm an, I, I absolutely believe in winning. But you need to learn how to lose gracefully because you're eventually going to lose in life. Not me. You just haven't lived long enough. Sorry, buddy. You will. And can, can I get some of us older fellas, either we got gray hair or we ain't got no hair. Hey, I was telling someone recently, you ought to come over to my house. I'll cut your hair. He's here in church today, a young 15-year-old young man. I said, I'll cut your hair for you. Make it look good. 
He said, oh, no. He said, I've been, I've been growing this for four years. I said, it's going to fall out eventually. Anyhow, might as well get used to it. Some of you, you got some good-looking hair this year. Okay? Joseph teaches us this loyalty, this perseverance, this forgiveness. He teaches us a reliance upon God and a, a rare, rare kind of this serenity, this, this precious patience. Anyone like waiting on God? Challenging, isn't it? He teaches us about that. Anybody play video games? Some of you play video games. Anyone ever use cheat codes? We don't like talking about that. Four of you admitted it. Bunch of liars. I'm going to get you to the altar eventually. Anyone use cheat codes? Anyone ever use cheat codes before? We all have. These cheat codes, and you say, I don't know what a cheat code is. Well, you're old if you don't know what a cheat code is. Number one, okay, a cheat code is this, these numbers and these way of uh, programming computers or the, the video game, etc., where you get more lives, you get invincibility, you get some help on these levels that make you, they help you to advance farther and faster instead of having to work it out and figure it out yourself. Again, these cheat codes in life, Joseph is going to share these things with us. We'll call them life lessons because that, that sounds much better instead of cheating, right? So he, he's going to teach us these life lessons. And to say that Joseph takes a leap of faith with his family is an understatement. He's going to teach us how to forgive and how to forget the failures and the faults of friends and family members. And we all need that, don't we? So let's jump right into it and get to it. So let me give you a little bit of review for a moment. We're talking about a leap of faith. Faith is vitally important in life. If you are a curmudgeon, if you are pessimistic, I know you call it being real. If you are a downer, dark, everything's doom and gloom all the time, I want to infuse you with a little bit of optimism, a little bit of light. A little bit of faith. Everything about our life has to do with being positive or faith. Again, you drove your car. I said it last week. And you believed, you believed that that other car in the other lane that's cruising at 55 miles an hour, that they were going to stay on their side of the highway. And you had the faith not on the guardrail, but on a dotted line or a solid line. You go to the restaurant and you have faith. You go to the supermarket and you believe that they did not inject some kind of poison in your T-bone steak. You believe that. You go to the doctor. You go and you get on a plane. You don't look at the pilot's credentials. You don't see, hey, give, here's a breath. Uh, we're going to make sure that you have not been drinking. You trust and believe that it's going to be all right. We all have an, a, a certain level of faith. In the Bible, faith is so very important. The book of Hebrews says in chapter 11, he said, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He said, well, I know God's got to show me something. God's got to prove it to me. God never sets out to prove things to people. He says it like this. He said, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe. Watch what he said. You must believe that he is. God is not a liar. God is not like mankind where he, the man twists the truth or tells you half truth or tells you things that you want to hear. God is not like that. God said, this is who I am. This is how you come to me. This is how you please me. If you want to go to my heaven, God said, you have to go my way. Amen. Very important. When we have a real faith, real faith refuses to be defeated. A real faith looks at situations and circumstances, and it says it doesn't matter. God said it's going to be all right. 
Real faith laughs in the face of, of failures. It laughs in the face of difficulties and obstacles. This is what we're going to learn about Joseph. Joseph takes an enormous leap of faith again and again. Last week we dealt with his parents. And I kind of explained and, and began to bring it out about his parents. How his mom died when he was a young man. And then later on how his dad, his dad loved him so much, but yet his dad created so much friction in their family by favoring Joseph, by pampering Joseph. We talked about helicopter parents and lawnmower parents last week and etc. But because of this, this favoritism that his dad showed him, it, it created so much sibling, sibling rivalry. Listen to what he says in Genesis 37.3. I'm just doing a review for a minute, and then I'll get into it. Does that sound all right? That's all right. Is that still hot? Ready? I'm, I'm using chicken legs right now, so it's a little hotter today. Genesis 37, 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. He, he not only told everybody, but he showed everybody, this is my favorite son. And it, because of that, verse 4, and when his brethren saw that his father loved them more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. These grown men, I'm not talking about boys. I'm not talking about young men. These grown men with families of their own, they could not get over these insecurities that they had had and these, these different things that had happened when they were children. When they were young boys, young men, these grown men still fighting this. So you're in good company if you're still fighting. You're in good company. Joseph began to dream, and God begins to give this man these dreams of what's going to happen in the future. He would tell these dreams to his brothers, and they hated him even the more for these dreams. Because the dreams began to foreshadow how Joseph would be in charge of his family. How they, he would rule over them, and they hated it because he was a younger brother. And they despised it. And so his dad sends Joseph. He said, he kind of makes him the overseer or the manager of, of all the brothers. He said, I want you to go and see how your brothers are doing. See, make sure that they're working. And then bring me back the report and tell me what's going on. And so he says in verse 18, and when they saw him afar off, it's about the brothers seeing Joseph. And they, even before he came near to them, they conspired against him to slay him. To say that Joseph came from a dysfunctional family is to say the least. It's quite an understatement. His brothers hated him so much they're willing to get rid of the competition. Let's kill our brother. And watch what he says in the next verse, 19. And they said, and let's behold, behold this dreamer cometh. They hated him. As a daddy. They hated him because of what God was doing in his life. So they said they, they're going to kill him. Some of you, I promise you, that you will suffer ridicule, and possibly betrayal from the hands of your own family members because of your stance for Almighty God. I promise you, your friends will talk bad about you if you're a real Christian. Now, if you're a lukewarm Christian, they're going to talk good about you any day because you're going to do exactly what they do and you're going to think you're going to heaven and you're not going to go to heaven. Amen. Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. That's what Jesus said. That's not what Pastor Carter said. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I, would, I, wa I want you to either be hot or cold. Get in or get out. That's what Jesus said. Amen. 
Well, preacher, I'm trying to make sure that, that this is the right way. Well, see, you're learning about God. As long as you're doing that and you're advancing in God, amen, that's all right. But if you're just saying, I'm sticking my foot in the mud and I refuse to give Jesus my life, then again, that's not where you want to be because eventually we're all going to die. Eventually we're going to breathe our last breath and we're going to stand before Jesus himself and give an account of our life. And we don't want to be wanting in that day. Amen. Again, I'm going to tell you, do not let down the standard when they ridicule you. Do not go backwards and retard or slow down or regress in your growth in God. But go forward by the power of God Himself. No matter what they say. No matter what they do. Because again, they could not. They said, I hate this boy. Their own flesh and blood. And watch how they say it. Not because of daddy only. Because of his dreams. I hate him. How come God has to help him? How come God has to be favorable to him? God loves each and every one of us. Amen. So they plot to kill him. As he's coming, they strip him out of his coat. They throw him into a pit, and they were going to kill their brother. But they came up with another idea instead, and they said, let's sell him into slavery. That's much better. Then his blood's not on our hand. We'll get someone else to kill him for us. Again, what a clear conscience on that one. Just human traffic your brother. Man, I got it. I can sleep at night for that one. These, again, I didn't get into his brothers. His family is messed up royally. God usually does that. He goes to the ones that are messed up the most. And he makes us his children. So they cast him into the pit and they sit down to eat. They hear him crying. They hear him and then they, they pull him out of the pit. And, and I, my imagination, and as I'm seeing this, and, and I see him crying and begging. His ten, ten of his brothers are there. And I see him looking him in the eye. Enough to lie. Reuben! And they're selling him into slavery. And each one of his brothers has a different temperament. Each one of his brothers, no doubt they had good times together. Simeon, what are you doing? Help! He's crying. He's pleading. And you know some of them had to look away. And they had pulled off that coat of many colors, the Bible says. Whether he was completely naked, we don't know. Or whether he just had on his undergarments, we don't know. I see one of his brothers taking his coat off and putting it on Joseph and maybe even kissing him as they betrayed him. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? They sell him, I see, and being tied because where they live down to Egypt is at least a 250-mile journey. And he's a slave. No one cares about a, a slave. So I see them tying his hands and maybe pulling him behind the camel. His feet bloodied. All the chafing of the sand. His back burned from the sun beating down. So cold at night, they won't let him by the fire because he began to stink. They take him to Egypt and they sell him to the slave markets. And a man by the name of Potiphar buys him. And we know the story from a little bit last week in chapter 39, verse 1. So Joseph brought, was brought down to Egypt. Potiphar, an officer of, of Pharaoh, he buys him. Verse 2. And the Lord was with Joseph and he was a prosperous man. Each step, each step and... God is going to take him higher and higher. And when he reaches a certain pinnacle, it's like God removes it and he goes even lower and deeper. You said, man, I don't understand why God would do that. You have to understand that the higher God has you slated to go, the deeper he's going to first take you. Why? Because he's going to dig down deep and lay a foundation of holiness 
and righteousness and godly character. So when you go higher, He can use you for His glory. And by the grace of God, you're not going to fall. Amen. This is what God wants. you got to understand, God knows what He's doing. And we've got to learn to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not to our own understanding. So Joseph, the Bible said, the Bible said, And the Lord was with Joseph. Very important. Some of you are getting ready to go into a next chapter of your life. You really, 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 really may resent what is going on. You hate everything about it. Some of you can't wait for the next chapter of your life. Closing the Marine Corps, your, your, your enlistment, you're done. You're done with all what, what you've done for the country. And you're ready to go do something else. I want to reassure you, if you put God first in your life, He'll be with you. He'll be with you. And listen to how it goes on a little farther. Verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made everything, that made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So this man, he's a slave owner, Potiphar. He puts Joseph in charge of everything. Again, we don't know, the Bible's silent, how many years he is there. Maybe he started out in the field. And they recognized this guy's different. And then he made, maybe he's an overseer in the field. And he began to move up in the ranks rather quickly. He said, hey, dude, won't you come work for me? Potiphar is out there one day, and he saw that work ethic. He saw there was something unique about Joseph. And he began, he said, you come over here, and you work in my house. You come and serve food at my house or whatever it was. He's a good-looking young man. He's a, he looks just like Pastor Carter. He's just really good-looking. He's ripped. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Hey, this is what God gave me. I'm sorry, okay? Jealous of me. I understand, but it's all right. You pray it through. Okay. And maybe, again, we begin to climb. Makes him the overseer, the leader of everything. And Potiphar's wife, the mercy and the grace of God, doesn't even mention her by name. Potiphar's wife says, man, I like what I see. And we talked about that last week. She said, I want you to come and have sex with me. And he said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. He said, I will not. He said, my master, your husband, put me in charge of everything except for you. He said, you belong to him. You're his wife. How can I do this great evil and sin against God? The man had character. Man, give us young men and women that have godly character. Amen. They will not stop. They will not, they will not cave, but they'll be, they'll serve God with integrity. Because if you don't have integrity, you don't have anything. I'm telling you. I wouldn't even pick you to be on my team. Amen. If I couldn't trust you, I couldn't have you on my team. Amen. Don't, wouldn't you rather to be worthy of someone's trust? To be trustworthy? Well, you can be that way. You can be that way. We all, we all decide who we're going to be. So this man, he refused. And so one day he was in the house and, and she grabbed him. The Potiphar's wife grabs Joseph. She said, lay with me. Do it now. Come on. Take me right here. And he runs. He said, no. And he ran and he, he, he ran and he left his coat in her hands. She was scorned. She had been rejected. She took his coat and laid it there. When the, her husband comes home, he said, See, that Hebrew slave that you brought in here came in here and tried to molest me. He tried to rape me. Some of us think well, if we stand for God, it's, it's going to be all right. Amen? Well, it should be, shouldn't it? Oh, it should be. But that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to get out of the situation we're in. Why? God knows what's going on in your life. And if you'll trust Him, it'll be all right. We're talking about a leap of faith. So this man takes him, he puts him in the prison. Check this out. Check this out. Verse 39, or excuse me, chapter 39, verse 20. Joseph's master took him, put him in a prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. He was innocent. 
He was absolutely innocent. The Bible states it. And even so, well, we can take a step back and, and did Potiphar really think that he was innocent? Potiphar had the authority to have this man executed. If he did that to your wife, and you're not, you're not a godly man, surely off with his head. But did he really believe what his wife told him? Or did he see something else? In his wife. He already saw the immorality. He already saw different things. Again, we don't know. But there's going to be times that, that brothers, sisters, you're going to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're going to stand against temptation. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to deliver you. You might be accused. You might be accused. Well, what should I do? Remember during those times that all things work together for good. That it's going to be all right. And God has you in His hands. So watch what He says. Watch what He says. Check this out. This next one. Verse Chapter 39, verse 1, And the Lord was with Joseph. He's gone from his brothers betraying him. Pit. Slavery. Now false imprisonment with a heinous allegation. What do you do when it's so dark and it keeps getting darker? What do you do when your hope is shattered? Your hope in God is shattered. What do you do? Do you become better? Or do you become bitter? Do you push God out of your life because now you can't trust Him? Do you become mad, angry, I'm going to exact revenge when it's my turn. You just let God have His way. See, all of us have to answer those questions. On our way to church today, I was telling my wife, we're just talking about certain things, and, and I made the statement, it sounds good that, that this is how I'm going to be the rest of my life, etc. I plan to. I plan to be a Christian the rest of my life, having a, a great relationship with God the rest of my life. I plan that, amen? amen. I plan that. Anybody plan that? Yes, sir. Two of you plan that. Anybody else plan that? Amen. Okay, you plan that. There you go. Interact with me, okay? I need your help, okay? I'm going to preach to you anyhow. If you, if you fall asleep on me, I'm going to preach to you. Uh, by osmosis, I'm going to get it in there. <laughs> on our way to church, I said, but what if? What if something happens in seven years from now and I get bitter? I don't want to. And I'm not claiming it, but I'm not an idiot also either. I know I am what I am by the grace of Almighty God. Amen. Yes, the grace of God and my choices. Amen. It works together. It's bone and marrow, but that's another time. So here he, he's going into prison, and the Bible says, And the Lord was with Joseph. He shows him, shows him mercy, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners. So here he is again. Now, Dad's house, he's elevated. Over in the, the slavery, he's elevated. In the prison, he's elevated. Circumstances are horrendous, but yet God is with with him. We've got to let re really remember we're taking a leap of faith. We're going to trust God with all of our life. Everything. But it looks so dark. God raises the dead. God raises the dead. God can do anything, anytime, anywhere with anyone. Nothing is impossible to God. Nothing. So he's there. So the Bible tells us that these two other guys are thrown into prison. Let me just kind of get ready to close. These two other guys are thrown into prison. and So Joseph's in charge. Joseph's kind of like the under warden, if you would. There's a warden. And then he's the dude that's in charge of everybody. 
So he tells them, check, check this out. Check this out. Verse, uh, go to chapter 40, verse 2, please. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers, against the chief of the bakers. He put them into the prison, into the ward in the house of the captain of the guard, into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. So these two guys, they're thrown into prison. One's a chief baker, one's a chief butler. Time goes on, and they both have a dream. They have a dream the same night. They have a dream. So they come, Joseph comes in in the morning and said, they're sad. He said, why are you guys sad? He said, well, we had this dream. We don't understand why we had this dream. He said, tell me the dream. So they begin to tell him the dream. The, the butler goes first, and he said, this is what I dreamed. <clears throat> and he, uh, Joseph interprets it, and he said, well, you're getting ready. Pharaoh's getting ready to give you your job back. He said, but when you get your job back, remember me. He said, because I was thrown here, and I was, I was sold into slavery, and then I was, I was thrown into this prison. I've done nothing wrong. He said, just remember me. Bring me out of this place. And then the baker, he said, man, that's a, such a, a good uh, interpretation. Here's what I dream. He said, well, in three days, you're going to get killed. I said, what? I love Joseph. I love Joseph. He tells the truth no matter what. What am I supposed to do, placate it? Am I supposed to tell you some false truth? Someone recently was saying, well, you, I don't like the way you said this. and I, don't, I said, if that is red and you say it's green, am I supposed to look at you and say, okay? Or do I tell you, no, it's red? What am I supposed to do? Well, I don't like that. You hurt my feelings. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I'm trying to get you to heaven. Amen. Well, I don't like that. It's all right. You don't have to. You've got to answer God. It's all right. It's all right. And I love you no matter what. Okay? I love you no matter what. So it happens. In three days, it happens exactly like Joseph said. So the one dude, he's, he's exalted. He gets, gets his job back. The other dude, he's killed in three days. But then the Bible tells us this in verse 23 of the same chapter. And yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. He forgot him. You ever been and you've done everything right, but yet you're still invisible? No one knows and they don't care about you. Watch what happens. Check this out. Next verse. Verse 1. It came to pass at the end of two full years. Two full years of being forgotten. Your hope is there again. I'm getting out. Your hope is there. I'm getting out. The dreams are finally going to come to pass. Two more years. Ever been in a formation? You're running. You come right back to the company area and they keep on going. You're like, oh! And they do it again and again. Anybody? You know what I'm talking about. And you probably let it. You probably, okay. But after a while, you said, who cares? You get your second win. I don't care. I can keep this up going all day long. You get what I'm saying? I see Joseph like that. He's a little frustrated at first. But then he's like, whatever. God's God, God, God has it. So this is what I'm going to advance a little bit. So Pharaoh has this dream. And... And the butler's like, oh, man, verse 9, check this out. Then speak the chief butler on the Pharaoh saying, I do remember my faults this day. I remember this dude, he interpreted my dream. I was supposed to get him out of prison two years ago. So, again, somebody might forget. So if they forget about you, have mercy, okay? So two years go by, and so Joseph's brought out of prison, and he begins to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. He tells him, he said, 14 years are getting ready to come by. He said in the first seven years, there's going to be unprecedented financial success. There's going to be so much financial success. We're going to talk about it next week, be it the will of the Lord. He said, and then after that, there's going to be seven years of, of this, this grave, grave famine where people are going to lose their lives. There's going to be no food. He said, this is what God's getting ready to do. And he said, so Joseph, true to how he is, he, he begins to tell Pharaoh. Pharaoh's like the president. He's like the, the top dude of the free world. And he begins to tell him, he said, Joseph said he's a prisoner. He tells him, choose a man. 
put this dude over this and this yada, yada, yada. And so Pharaoh said, well, you're going to be the man. I'm going to make you the CEO of this new corporation. I'm going to make you the president, the prime minister. You are in charge. Finally, after 13 years, after going through every unconceivable um, that heartache and headache and frustration, God exalts this young man. Again, if you'll give God chance in your life, if you'll give God the proper due respect in your life, and you'll believe Him and trust Him, He'll make everything good that He said. Amen. So check this out as I finish up. My goodness ready to come to the music in 30 minutes okay just joking okay verse 50 so he's now the new dude in charge all of this financial prosperity is coming I'm talking unprecedented prosperity and unto Joseph was born were born two sons before the years of famine came Azaneth Azaneth bears him, verse 51. He calls his firstborn Manasseh. Manasseh means forgetfulness. He said, God made me to forget all of my trials that I went through. See, sometimes, and I'll deal with it another time, but you have to be mature mentally emotionally most of all spiritually to let God have his way in your life see God's going to do things in your life and you're not going to agree with them I don't agree with them until we go to pray once we go to pray we begin to surrender remember what our Lord said remember when he is grappling there in the garden of Gethsemane he said not my will but thine be done. Not, and again, there's going to be difficult times when we must demonstrate this forgetfulness of people that have wronged us. But if we just forget without doing the first one, forgiving, it's called ghosting. If we just forget about it, we don't forgive it, it's called ghosting. And that's going to come back again and again and again to haunt us. We have to release and forgive them, no matter what it is. There, we're all going to sustain harm and hurt at the hands of other people, at the hands of our family, at the hands of our friends. But we must, again, leave it there and, and not, try not to harbor it. Try not to, to meditate about it and ruminate it. Again, I know it happened. We're not saying it didn't happen. I know. And some will hold on to it again and again. Well, this is what it made me. I know it made us. I know it formed us and shaped us. But it does not define us. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go or else it'll kill you spiritually and emotionally. It'll absolutely, it, it's, it's like taking that poison every day in your life. That bitterness that destroys. Well, they were wrong. I know they were. Forgive them. Well, I'm not going to. They don't deserve it. None of us deserve forgiveness. Jesus said when he was on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, my Lord. Again, it's so easy just to flippantly say it. Well, I'm not going to do it. Here's the promise to the music, please, guys and gals. Here's the promise. This is Jesus himself. Jesus said, if you will not forgive men their trespasses, it's what Jesus said. If you will not forgive when people do you wrong, neither will my heavenly Father forgive your sins, your trespasses. Do you want to be forgiven? So I want to be forgiven because all of us have done wrong. 
And it's only the grace and mercy and the love of God that we're even here breathing. Well, it's time that you forgive. Joseph, when he is made prime minister, he doesn't seek out Potiphar's wife, make her publicly confess that she lied. He's the dude. He's the man. He doesn't go home and chop his brother's heads off. But he's forgiven. Now he's forgotten about. Not really literally forgetting because you're remembering. But it doesn't Say, I may, God made me forgive. To God, he said, it's all right. It's all right. Get in tears, Lord. It's all right. It's all right. Lord, I released him. See, it couldn't affect him. You see this leap of faith that he took? It takes faith. It takes being positive. It takes being in tune with God to be able to do this. The harm, the injustice, the cruelty. But he said it's all right. It's all right. God's got a plan. It's all right. So I, I forgive them and I forget about them. See, Jesus did that for you and me. Not when we were his friends. Not when we were his family. But the Bible said when we were sinners. He proved his love to you and me when we were enemies. He loves us so much. But see, he doesn't stop there. And he said, but I wronged God. And he said, if you'll come to me, I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you give you eternal life that you can be my children. See, Jesus cares about you. And only Jesus can do this. What about it to you today? Maybe you are a Christian already. And you're struggling with things that have happened. I'm leaving you with my last verse today. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. Remember that 432. Ephesians 4.32, you need this one. Be kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We need forgiveness, don't we? But we need to forgive others, don't we? It's time. Come on, stand with me today, everyone. Please stand with me. As you bow your heads, let's just pray together real quick. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for this day, for your eternal word, for the what you've given me to share with the people. Now, Father, we commend it into your hands. Help men and women to find relief. Help them to find that true satisfaction in their soul, that deliverance, that forgiveness, my God, that they need from you but also let them be strong enough to forgive someone else. To take this leap of faith and go forward in you. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. You're already standing. I want to invite you. Come on, let's all.